everybody. My name is Kristen Silberto. I'm a contributor and columnist for Scribe Magazine, and welcome to Scribe Talks. Today, I'm speaking with film director Travis Stevens, as well as Sarah Lynn and Josh Rubin. Together, they all worked on the latest horror film, A Wounded Fawn, a film that's available on Shudder and AMC+. And you do not want to miss out on this intense and very creative horror film, a film that has art, beauty, mythology, and a serial killer, each add to a distinct color to Travis Stevens' latest horror film. About a successful museum creator whose romantic weekend becomes a surrealistic nightmare. And like I said, I got to speak with all three of them, and they were just all really excited to talk about this film, and I'm so excited to share this interview with all of you. So first it's going to cut to Travis, then it's going to go to Sarah, followed by Josh at the end. So enjoy the interview. Hi, Travis. I'm Kristen from Scribe Magazine. How are you? I'm doing well, Kristen. I'm excited to talk to you and talk to Scribe. Oh, I'm so excited to be talking to you because you are, in my opinion, a horror director icon in the making, honestly, because I've loved and enjoyed about every single work you've done. And I think this is your best project to date. Thanks. It, it felt like a, a lot of elements really came together on it. And I, I'm super grateful for um, the reaction that the movie's received so far. I mean, the praise has been wonderful because I got to see it at Tribeca earlier this year and then I watched it twice in preparation for this interview. And I just loved every single minute of it. And I am watching it at least three times now. I've gotten something new out of each watching of the film. So I want to start with the research process because this delves heavily into like Greek mythology. What made you want to explore a topic like that? So the original screenplay that had come to me was written by Nathan Faudry. And it was the story of a man and a woman who go to the cabin and the, um, the Aaron is, or they were he, the Furies, uh, were there. So that was already in the project. Uh, and so because that story sort of covered similar ground that I had covered in Girl on the Third Floor, I had to find a, a, uh, my own way into it so that mm -hmm. it didn't feel like I was repeating myself. And so um, the key that unlocked it for me was uh, sort of symbolism. Right. Like, I want to focus on on the visual symbolism and the thematic symbolism. So Although I wasn't super familiar with Irene as, as sort of uh, uh, myths, when I started researching them and started looking at how they were uh, utilized in uh, plays, literature, and paintings, and fine arts, what I took away from it was these are goddesses of vengeance that their objective is simply to get somebody to take accountability for their actions, mm -hmm. which is not quite the same as like you call on the RNAs and they're going to come and just eviscerate someone, you know, right. it's not, they're not Cenobites or, 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 or something, you know? And I, I thought that was something that was pretty interesting for 2022. Um, I always say it's like, I was not a classics major. I came into this, uh, like the process of working on this is how I, I educated myself yeah. uh, about the Aaron is. And so um, people with a better understanding may have a much richer <laughs> and deeper yeah. uh, 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 insight, different, different examples of, of sort of how they've been utilized. But, but I just think like, it's insane to me that these, that this myth that, was uh you know they are older than gods like older than zeus right and that they could still be relevant to today i thought was just incredible and that's the great part about this because i feel like it's also a story where a person can really learn a lesson and especially yeah. from uh you know josh Rubin's character bruce in the film but i have to ask you um was what was the most challenging process for this film like was it the research actually itself or just the filmmaking process overall? Because it sounds like most of the timing when this was going on, COVID was happening. So did you face that challenge? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I I think the, for whatever reason on this one, uh, creatively, the, 
everything lined up pretty easily. Like it was um, like when I decided that I was going to really lean into the symbolism and and take a more surrealist approach to how I was going to tell the story and what the story was going to do, that meant wherever my mind went, whatever random things I could sort of try to incorporate that into it. So so on the, the screenwriting stage, that was really easy. And then I felt that it also applied to the production where because it was such an out there script, mm-hmm. who I was hiring, the the sort of factors that that you evaluate a costume designer or a director of photography, a composer, all of that was different than it normally is. So I was able to hire people that were really suited to this wild story. So right. that was easy. And then when we were making the movie, I guess the hardest part about it is, you know, I was trying to bring these uh, wild delusions to life in a very tactile way. Uh, so we we felt like we were seeing it in the real world, even though it was unreal what was happening. And I guess the mechanics of pulling that off was the biggest challenge. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, so one thing I noticed when I was watching the film and just about each shot that I noticed, the color red stands out prominently, whether it be the bracelet, or the costume design, you know, red is a prominent color. And I was like, basically counting how many times it's in the film. What made you want to incorporate that? It's amazing because uh, you're not the only person who's observed that. And again, I would say, I don't think it was intentional. I think it was, it was sort of not intentional in, in, in the way that it can be, where you're like, this character's color scheme is blue. This mm-hmm. character's is red. I think what this was is it appears consistently throughout the film because we were approaching the film so intuitively, I think these things just naturally came up, even if they we weren't consciously saying it needs to be a red bracelet. Like, like basically, so the red bracelet, which is in the opening scene, I saw that the day of. Oh, wow. And and so the costume designer had his own reason for it. Cool. The house that we picked had the red door. Cool. The the other ways, it's like they may have been decisions based on uh, sort of a very narrow perspective, but I think it adds up and feels cohesive because everybody was on the same wavelength uh, and, and sort of tuned into the same rhythm. That's really awesome because it sounds like it was the best collaborative process that you got to have as a director because of that. Yeah, it's really, really nice working with people that get it, especially on something like this that's so open for interpretation. And so it allowed me to sort of give them the space to sort of interpret it. And it was just a different conversation than, than a movie that's more grounded in reality. Mm-hmm. And now what was the casting process like for to bring on Josh and Sarah? Because they are great together. I love the scenes that they share together. What was it like working mm-hmm. with them? Well, Sarah was uh, uh, somebody that I had been talking to about the movie for uh, throughout the writing process. And I would say I even incorporated uh, her ideas, her vibe, her her music choices, her her. Uh, interest in in sort of uh, uh, justice into the screenplay. Mm-hmm. So she was a, a, a quality that I had a pretty good understanding of. And so in trying to pair her, it was about sort of finding the right dance partner. And, and I think with Josh Rubin, I was so impressed with his filmmaking and performance in Scare Me. I, I wasn't uh, as familiar with his, his college humor work, yeah but as a filmmaker i just was like this guy is so dialed into what he's doing on camera that i thought it would be like working with like a like a colleague like right. more than more than just an act, actor that i could also really sort of um rely on him as a filmmaker as well and and i think what he brings is He's in such control of himself in his in his face, in his body language, and he understands the rhythm of a scene so well that he can give you these little punctuation points. So as a director, I just kind of could just sort of sit back and let the two of them do their thing. It was really nice. 
it was it, their chemistry is just out of this world and I really got a hold of Josh he's just a character that you just ride on this film with and it's nuts and then okay. my fun- oh go ahead so so sorry to jump in uh Sarah's in the waiting room now okay. but I go ahead and ask your last question and then I'll I'll have her join no, or, it's okay. she can, or she can listen into the last question. <laughs> no, it's okay. I don't want to hold Sarah up. I don't want to hold no. anybody. She, <laughs> don't worry. She's at all. fine. She's fine. She, Not to speak yeah. for Sarah, but we're all I, I, yeah. we're all friends here, Kristen. We're all friends okay, here. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna let Sarah and Sarah should be here now. I think she's turning on her camera and mic, but uh go ahead and ask your last question while Sarah gets situated. Well, well, just before you ask that last question, I mean, Sarah Lind, like if you ever get a chance to work with her, the greatest actress I've ever, ever worked with. Oh, oh, I'm excited to talk to her then. I'm so excited. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Okay. So my final question is, is the cinematography. I mean, the cinematography is really great in this film. So can you just discuss what was it like bringing on uh, that unique element to the film? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think I sort of talked about this earlier, like mm-hmm. where one of the pleasures was was working with people because the, it was such a wild movie. Like you can work with people that you see that potential to get wild. And and I think with Kasusha Jenenfeld, uh, I don't think she had done a feature film before. And normally mm-hmm. you you kind of want somebody who's had that experience because a lot of it isn't just about creative. It's about the logistics right. and sort of like managing stuff but she is incredible at both where she has such a great taste in 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 film and has such a when when i would point to a filmmaker she understood sort of what aspect of that work was important to me and how we could incorporate this and then also she's a really kick-ass team leader and everybody really looked up to her and like i had said like one of the challenges on this is like bringing these fantastic visions to life well you need a good team leader uh because sometimes it takes a minute to get it right and she she was wonderful so yeah well i loved it thank you so much travis for your time i can't wait to see more of your work and i'm excited what's for next for you in the future honestly hi I, thank you so much for the chat enjoy sarah she's uh, an incredible actor so i'm gonna do this <laughs> <laughs> i love it Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank bye. you so much, Travis. Have a good night. You too. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Kristen. How so, are you? <laughs> okay. It's so nice to be speaking with you. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Oh, yeah. I must say congratulations on all your hard work for the film. Like I told uh, Travis, uh, the acting is just insane here I loved it and I just had to ask how did you and Travis meet up because I know this isn't your uh, first time working with him but your second time so what makes your collaboration so unique um I think our personal relationship is a big part of it um which is based on a lot of things but um you know some of the main things are similar sort of artistic tastes, uh, um, aesthetic tastes, um, you know, some of our goals or intentions with like making movies and our art and various art are in line. And so it's like such a treat to have that relationship going into uh, working with someone. So, yeah. Now, have you always been drawn to horror as an actor or no? Like, how did you like it? Yeah, I like it. I've done, I did some of it uh, a lot more when I was, when I was younger in Canada. Okay. Um, there's, there's a lot of horror for young actors, or at least certainly when I was in my early twenties, there's a lot of um, running and screaming sort of like horror stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, growing up, I always really liked it, but, um, watching horror movies, I mean, but I wouldn't say I'm like a buff. There wasn't a lot. I, like I watched more of them as an adult because, uh, as a kid, especially though now too, I get like utterly terrified watching almost any horror movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> like I, I, I would sort of find one, it would terrorize me. And then I would be like, I'm just going to keep watching it until it isn't <laughs> like my ass. It's so gory or like terrifying. 
<laughs> exactly. Like I didn't sleep for two days when I saw Poltergeist as a kid. Oh, same. So that, right? It was terrifying as a child. But then I, I just watched it like every weekend for yeah, for so that it would stop. And yeah. Stop the television at night, for instance. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's like, I feel like nowadays what we just got through with Halloween, everybody was watching their horror movies at night, like just like terrified to be like, oh my gosh, you yeah. know. But yeah, um, so what is it as an actress, what challenges you the most when you approach a project like a wounded fawn? That's a that's a good question. Um I think that the hardest thing in my opinion about acting is um making a, a real person you know mm -hmm. and trying not to rely on a, a shtick or like um phoning it in as they say uh, mm -hmm. and trying to to be moment to moment right uh, it's hard because it, you feel exposed but then sort of paradoxically the more exposed you feel the less that the audience typically sees you the actor the more they see the the character but it feels like you're like I just like yeah. took off my pants in front of everyone and everyone's like, <laughs> oh that was acting and I'm like oh I didn't feel like acting so it's hard to it's hard to get to that vulnerable place a lot right 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 yeah totally and then what made Josh make oh, I'm wording this wrong excuse me what made working with Josh you know your co-star so uh wonderful because you like I been saying you guys are just remarkable together and just wonderful so what made it so I guess easy to work with him uh thank you for saying that that's really lovely and he was a dream to work with um for a lot of reasons uh his understanding of the the character was really deep um he also had a take on it that I think is quite unique like that sort of bad guy character that bad man killer guy character he does something really unique with it which is exciting to work with um he is very funny yeah he's very like um j j he's like he's like helium like he just <laughs> lightens the mood everywhere he goes which is really nice on set especially like we shot like 30 nights or 25 nights in a row like oh my gosh. gosh so we were all you know in this weird headspace together and and he made everyone laugh and smile which is such a gift on set right and he's really present we I think work in a similar way which is like dip in dip out like action we're doing it cut we're you know kind of back to ourselves um and it's nice to be able to get to it really quickly with a with another actor and to really be in the moment together so i i mean honestly there aren't enough nice things to say about josh oh yeah oh and then uh one of my final questions for you is uh there's a lot of greek mythology going into this did you do any research for your role going in some, or yeah yeah some um it, it, it was it was funny to play one of the furies because their their goddesses are deities and so they're they're unlike almost any other character you'll play where like there are no stakes they they know they'll win you can't hurt them right <laughs> it's not personal like they're just like we we are gonna do this until it's over yeah we're and, coming after you no matter what <laughs> yeah and like they're they're furious in a, in a sense but also like kind of unbothered because they're like you're wrong <laughs> like, we yeah. don't have to, you know like we don't have to doubt ourselves we're from like mount olympus or something like that you know like we're, we've been called in because you're wrong so there's not the like turmoil that a, a human character would feel and it was fun to to play around with that you know yeah that's so awesome but uh thank you so much for speaking with me it was so wonderful to speak with you you too and thanks for for your kind words and for watching oh. well I can't mm -hmm. wait to see more of your work and I just must say so 
It was funny. Um, so I'm watching the movie and at the very end, you have all this sparkle on your face. And you know the thing that's going around on TikTok where the Taylor Swift make the whole world shimmer. If you watch that Bejeweled thing, I don't know if you're a Swifty. No. Okay, so like all I could think of is like the Bejeweled song playing as your whole face is lit. If you go on TikTok, you might understand the trend. But I do it right now. <laughs> as soon as we like, all I could see was just that song playing and and you look great, by the way, with all the jewels <laughs> on your face. I mean, <laughs> so, I don't want a face covered in jewels. Like it's a yeah. true, right? <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's so epic. Like I said, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful to speak with you. Oh, you too. All righties, <laughs> have a good one. Bye. Bye. Hi, Josh. It's so nice to speak with you. It's a pleasure. Do you like my edge light, my heavenly angel light that's coming in? It's it's perfect. I love it. I just perfect. need to hear see some chirps and hear the organs playing, and then you're like yeah. in that heavenly cloud isk, you know, love I think it. It would, it would complement the um demonic toxic vibe of my character pretty well. Yep. Um, I was just gonna <laughs> say you have some dark demons to this character who's instantly like charming. And also a serial killer. So I have to ask, was it fun playing the villain? Oh my God, it's always so fun. It's always so fun to play, especially when you have the opportunity to get like straight up bombastic, like in the part two of, of this movie. That's why I had to do it. I mean, on top of like, yes, there's, there's the feminist message and the style mm -hmm. working with another, you know, another brilliant director, especially being a filmmaker myself. But um, oh yeah, it's always so, so fun. And I realized too, it didn't quite occur to me but it was, this is obviously the case both Sarah and I get to sort of play two characters in the in this movie and so mm -hmm. think about it as, it's just a, an ideal type of vehicle I think uh for any art any kind of artist you know to exercise yeah totally and then I know you've done directing and you know acting you you've done it all so I gotta ask is there one that you prefer doing one over the other I love them all in, in different ways. <clears throat> I love the solitary kind of uh, weirdo pushing the boulder up the hill nature of writing. Acting is great because um, it's kind of all id doing its thing. And like, I'm, I'm guided by the leader, by the filmmaker. But I think right now, filmmaking is probably in slightly first place above everything else, just because I get to control my own ship and um, manage <clears throat> personalities, bring buddies in and sort of make calls and move as quickly and efficiently as I, I want to, or take as much time as I, I can possibly afford. Um, but I love it. I love it all. And I, I, um, I think what I'm realizing is I, I really admire filmmakers too, who like, you can't quite pin down like creatives. You can't quite pin down. I love a filmmaker that shows up in movies or an actor that turns out to direct something or publish a novel or, you know, um, that sort of thing, just like constantly, constant output in different mediums, just as like being an artist, it's it's fun stuff. Yeah, of course. So now I got to ask, how did you approach this film? And was it a challenge for you to take on this role, like for a character like Bruce? Um, I think the only challenging part, and I've spoken about this a little bit, is just that like, I, I had to play into my like, sensual self a little bit as, as like a comedian for, for mm -hmm. so long, I haven't quite often um, exercise that or gotten offered to play the part of like, you know, the, the handsome dude seducing someone, let alone seducing someone to kill them. So I think that that was really the big challenge. Um, but otherwise, it was just, uh, it was a hell of a good time and a great exercise, you know? Yeah, totally. And it's funny, because my fiance watches Game Changers, and he knew you. And I said, Oh, I'm gonna talk to Josh today from that show Game Changers and his eyes lit up. He's like, you're talking to who? So I must say, do you like doing more of the comedic aspects or the horror aspects more? Or do you like bringing the both together? Because I know you I've seen werewolves within. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love all of it. Like Game Changer is great, because I'm, I get I scratch so many itches. I'm working with Sam Reich, who I've known since I was a kid, basically, since I was a teenager, we met in summer camp. Um, I get to scratch the improv itch. I never get to get up on the stage and sort of improvise anymore. So I sort of get to do that with these, you know, other great comedians. <clears throat> um, and I love the horror aspect of it too, because I was a horror lover before I was a comedian, before I got into comedy. My 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 sibling 
um, my sister, Rachel, she really was the gateway, you know, in, into horror for me. She introduced me to Friday the 13th and Freddy Krueger and all this stuff. I shouldn't have been watching it at such an early age. Um, I think I, I think I love them both equally. I think right now, because horror is such a challenge, jump scares are a challenge. It's a mm -hmm. challenge getting off the ground as a filmmaker. I think that's something I'm more fascinated with right now, but I'm open to I'm open to all genres and and certainly into doing like hard comedy, so to speak, like in the future for sure. Oh, okay. And then I have like one other final question for you. And that is, how did you approach this role in terms of like research? Because it's heavily in Greek mythology. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the the hard part was really on Travis, you know, he was the one who was reading up on surrealist art and had, you know, kind of knew his stuff about Greek mythology. Um, and I was I was just kind of there for the ride. And so I was I was drawing maybe you could say I was drawing like a little bit of inspiration from like, you know, Patrick Bateman, you know, from the American Psycho of it all. But I was really just sort of like I, I feel like I was drawing more from <clears throat> mansplaining know-it-all egoistic. Right. M was was kind of a fun thing to channel into. It was like, I think I know this guy who loves to drop knowledge and loves to drop names and show people how smart he is. That's just such a um an egocentric uh uh quality to some of these like mans mansplainers, um, mm -hmm. um all of which are, you know, most of which are, are toxic. And um, you know, we just you have a you have contextualized the type of story that you're telling is about you know, women don't often mm -hmm. know the types of men that they're engaging with when they open these dating apps and stuff, you know, what types of, of men these are. And so I thought, you know what, let's, let's lean into the, the guy who, you know, will, will tell you how you're feeling, but not listen to you like a true narcissistic personality. And so that was, I think that was like the, the draw of inspiration for me it was like, oh, what yeah. kind of bad man can I draw from to portray, you know? Yeah, and the way I was also see, like saw your early at least envision your character as if I'm not sure if you saw fresh, but you have yeah. the same like almost kind of attitude as Sebastian brings to the film, and I was just like, oh yeah. And I, the great part is I've been recommending people this one. I was like, if you liked Fresh, then you're gonna like this. Yeah. So yeah, you, I love Fresh. I, I, Sebastian brought a warmth to it that made it more terrifying, and I th I think Bruce, I I, I think. He, you probably get from the get go that that Meredith, that Sarah's character kind of likes someone who is a little more opinionated, let's say, mm -hmm. or like a slightly more icy. That is right. perhaps attractive to her character is my perception anyway. But that, the wonderful thing about Sebastian, I love Fresh. Uh, it's just, yeah, was, he, he plays so disarmingly warm up top as opposed to, you know, someone you quite, you you know, right away is, is right. Bad. Yeah, 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 of course. But thank you so much for your time. I don't want to keep you too much any longer, but you're wonderful. And I can't wait to see more of your work and hopefully more horror work. Bring more horror thank and comedy. You. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, me too. Me too. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, of course. All right. Once again, I'd like to thank Travis, Sarah, and Josh for taking the time out of their busy schedules to speak with me. It was an absolute honor. And y'all go check out a Wounded Fawn available right now. Do not sleep on this film. For now, hope you all subscribe to the YouTube channel and thank you all for watching. We will see you all next time.